Good morning, afternoon, or evening, as the case may be. I'm Mark Evanier. And I'm Serge Aragonés. I'm Stan Sakai. And I'm Tom Luth. And we're and the Groove crew. crew. We are. Indeed, yeah. we are. We are the four people who, for more years than we like to remember, have been bringing you a comic book called Groove the Wanderer. Uh, Mr. Luth here is the colorist of the book. Uh, Tom is working uh, at the moment with a cracked rib because uh, he had this pain and he went to his doctor and his doctor examined him and said, uh, have you been coloring a lot of crowd scenes? Because that seems to lead <laughs> to bodily injuries. Uh, Stan Sakai is the letterer of the book. He was lettering it for a while, but finally he decided I can do the whole page by myself. And he created this wonderful rabbit character of his, Usagi Yojimbo. And we will talk about that character a little later, what's up with him. And then everything else on the page that isn't involving words is done by Mr. Sergio Aragonis, who created Gru. And I'm going to make him tell us how that was for those of you who don't know the story. Sergio, take us back to the moment when you first decided to do, to do a comic book of your own. Yeah, this is, it was in the late 60s. I was in Europe for an extended trip, visiting cartoonists, editorial companies. And I realized that the majority of the comics done there were in humor. Uh, I, in the United States, there were comics about superheroes. They were about funny animals. They were um, about children. But humor, humor, there was not that much. So I decided, well, that's just time to start a comic doing what I do, or I've been doing for so long, which are magazine cartooning. And I started thinking about creating characters. And uh, the first one that I, that I thought was, uh, you, you can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you fine. Uh, the, the, the first one I thought was a, a, a silly brother for Tarzan, he had a twin brother, and he was very silly. And I said, oh, this is fantastic. I'm going to have a humor guy who, based on Tarzan, but uh, it was what became Gru in a way. So I was walking on the street thinking about it, and in a movie house, there's a big Tarzan, le, le, le frère de Tarzan, Tarzan's brother. Sergio, oh Sergio, Sergio, don't play with your, head, your headset. Your headset's making noise. Okay. Inst instantly, I said, well, there goes the idea. So slowly, I figured it out what there isn't in the comics. And I don't remember any humor about barbarians. And uh, I figured out, well, that'd be easy to draw dragons, castles, battles. I don't have to draw buildings or cars or, or things that are more complicated. Slowly thinking about it, came back, planted it, and I went to different publishers, and all of them said, we cannot publish if we don't know the rights. And I said, but in Europe, everybody owns, the, all the authors own their rights. I, I don't want to give the rights away. I, I want to own them. That'd be impossible. DC, Marvel, all the big companies decided that it was impossible. So for a long time, that was it, you know. And uh, w one day, Mark comes to me because he needed something. Yeah, well, you're, you're leaving out one of the most important people who helped finance grew, which was George Schlatter. Because mm -hmm. you were drawing everything on his stationery. Because <laughs> <laughs> you were working on the original, the, the revival of Laugh-In, when they brought the Laugh-In show back, and you were not only a writer on it and a cartoonist, but you were a cast member, That's usually true. usually playing an evil guy with a mustache. Black and, mustache. <laughs> That's right. And you have, and, and then you worked on Real People and some things with him, and you had piles and piles of Gru drawings on stationary of these shows That's i've got correct. some of your drawings where you're on it's on laugh in stationary and, <laughs> and real people stationary and oh, yeah. uh so you were doing all this stuff and you had done one two-page story all by yourself no tom no me no it was a two page the uh the uh one with the dragon was that two pages or was it five pages five pages what? whatever it's the story we ran in destroyer duck <laughs> <laughs> 
we were doing this benefit comic to benefit our friend Steve Gerber, who was um, uh, in a lawsuit with Marvel over the ownership of Howard the Duck. And the, the, the strategy on the part of the Marvel lawyers, which they actually had to admit to in court, was that they were trying to make the case so expensive that Steve would just drop it because he couldn't afford to do it. And they were penalized. Marvel had to pay Steve money, part, part of his legal bills, because they were found to have intentionally run up the, his bill. Uh, but even that would not cover the expenses of this. So we, we, a lot of us chipped in. We did this benefit comic. And I came to you. Uh, I came up to your house you were living in at the time. And I said, we want to print Gru in this book. And you opened up the drawer, which all the Gru stuff was in, and said, take anything you want. And I took this, that one little completed story, and we ran it and grew in Destroyer Duck. Uh, it was colored by a gentleman named Gordon Kent, uh, and uh, it got a lot of attention. And suddenly people are calling us and writing us saying, we want more stories of Gru. Now yes. you can pick up the story from there. Well, uh, then I decided that that was it. It looks good on paper. Uh, it, it's, it's perfect. So I've, uh, there was a, a new company well, what's important is the time span. This was in what years? In the 70s? Uh, we're, we're, getting, we're getting into the 80s here. Yeah, early 80s. Uh, yeah, but I, mean, I created, a, I was in Europe in the 60s. So from the 60s that I start thinking about GRU to the 70s, it took more than 10 years working on GRU with anybody who wanted it to publish it because they wanted to keep the rights. So when you publish it, that gave us an incentive to go to a, a publisher that has just came out called Pacific Comics. And it, it, when I asked them if they will publish the comic, they said, uh, I thought I wanted them to distribute it. And, they, and I was thinking of publishing myself. And they said, no, 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 we'll publish it for you. And I says, that sounds fantastic. Immediately, I call Mark and says, Mark, I want to do this comic, but I need you because there's no way I can do a comic with, with text because mostly everything I've done is pantomime. And Mark immediately jumped aboard and we plan with them, with uh, Pacific Comics, to do GRU. And uh, we work the, the, the issues and we did eight issues with them. Right. And yes. it worked everything. So Mark and goes from there because... Well, we did eight issues with them and then Pacific went out of business. So we did one issue with Eclipse and then they had a flood that wiped out most of the company. <laughs> but in the meantime, we had gotten inquiries from other publishers who said, you know, when these independent small companies go under, the ones we're trying to squeeze out of the marketplace uh, come to us. And we wound up doing uh, GRU for Marvel's Epic line. Uh, people Be because, then, Mar because Marvel by then realized that every author was not going to give them anything new because Pacific share no, no, gave us our copyright. Correct, yes. Yeah, and Mar that was Mar 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 Marvel wanted to get a piece of that type of uh, marketplace. And, uh, you know, at that time, people kept saying uh, in the business, oh, creator-owned comics never come out on time. They never last. They never come out on time. These guys don't know how to meet a deadline, uh, such. We then proceeded to do 120 issues of GRU in 120 months without missing a single deadline, <laughs> much of which was due to the gentleman opposite on the other side of this screen because uh, Tom Luth had replaced Gordon Kent as our colorist. Yeah, yeah, it's back and forth. It's hard to figure out where you are <laughs> on these screens. This is not a mirror you're looking at. You're looking at a screen. It's not reversed that way. Um, and we, since we had lettering, we needed a letterer. So let's tell, have Stan tell how he became involved with GRU. Well, I was doing ad advertising art, and I took a calligraphy class at the... Um, testing the city college. And I started teaching calligraphy. Uh, I mentioned this at CAPS on uh, the Comic Arts Professional Society in Los Angeles and Sergio 
Fairy the Bard and says, hey, I'm starting a new comic book called Guru the Wanderer and I need a letterer. Um, you do calligraphy, can you do comic book lettering? And I said, sure. <laughs> isn't, isn't that hard? <laughs> And so I started uh, doing um, Gru, but even before Gru, Sergio started, uh, was recommending me to other cartoonists for lettering. So I was lettering things for Frank Ridgway Simpkins, for uh, Lancelot, uh, Stan, for Stan Lee, uh, his, uh, the Spider-Man Sunday newspaper strips. And so um, even before I started lettering for Gru, I was lettering for other people too, on Sergio's recommendation, say, oh, Stan's a great letterer, even though I hadn't lettered anything for him at that time. So that's a great joke. Well, that's, that's a very good thing. Um, uh, I should mention here, if you look at the early issues of Gru, uh, Stan did some wonderful calligraphy there. Every so often, you'll see some clunky lettering on the splash pages and such. That's me. I lettered a few <laughs> things here and there until until... Stan seemed to be doing it so well that I didn't want to muck up his pages. And I have not lettered anything in Groove for a long time. Uh, now, our, our first colorist, Gordon Kent, uh, unfortunately, the late Gordon Kent, lovely friend of mine, he colored for a while. Gordon was a, um, a writer, producer for animation who wanted to pitch in. He was a friend of Steve Gerber's also, and he wanted to, he colored some of Destroyer Duck just because he wanted to be helpful. And then he came along for Gru, but he didn't really have the time to do that because he had a full-time job at animation. So we suddenly decided we needed another colorist. Tom, tell us, you pick up the story here now. Oh, uh, well, the first one, I think, is it number five, Pacific Gru, number five? And uh, I think it was that Gordon needed help to get the book finished, so I was given the sage story in the back of the book, a five-page story. And I did that. And by the time I turned that in, uh, Gordon had escaped. He, he was looking for a chance to get out. And uh, that's how I got on board the book. He was smarter than I was. <laughs> uh, we, for, to, we should tell people that one of the lasting remnants of Gordon's handiwork, um, Gordon was a good friend of mine, and he knew that I liked the color orange. I have a lot of things that are orange. You can see in my office that a lot of things are orange. I have an orange cup here. I have an orange water bottle. I have an orange bowl. I have an orange hourglass to remind me to what time it is to get up and walk around, things like that. You won so, my orange pumpkin? <laughs> you won my no, orange pumpkin? No, no, no. <laughs> anyway, um, so... Uh, that's the reason the Gru's jersey is orange. Yeah, and then when, said, when 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 uh, Mark got the, the whole thing to be orange, uh, I was asked, uh, "What is the material that uh, Gru is wearing?" And says, "Well, that that's a fur. You know that they turn a fur upside down." And uh, Gordon said, "Is orange all right?" He says, "That's perfect." You know so. <laughs> Yeah, it so, was anyway. it was orange from Mark from the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> Tom, Tom, could you just talk for a minute about the uh, you were coloring Gru at that time by a different method. You were coloring, you were watercoloring Xeroxes of the pages and marking mm -hmm. them with codes. It was a a technique that I don't think is used anymore any place for coloring comic books, which are now colored on computers. Um, how long did it take you to color an issue of Gru by that method? By that method, uh, a full issue about 10 days. Okay. Uh, what it was literally, uh, before they had good photocopies, they used photostats, which were kind of glossy. So they had to like wash them first so that watercolor would even stick to it. Mm -hmm. And we had color charts with 64 colors, basically 25%, 50 in solid uh, red, blue, and yellow, and the ways the mix giving you 64 colors, and you put in, you paint it, put in the code numbers. Uh, between then and computers, we went through about five different systems. Uh, that included, um, there were blue lines like they used in Europe, and we did some like that, but uh, they got interested in 
gray lines, which go back to the stats again, which are hard to paint on. Uh, basically an underexposed photo stat, you paint on those, then they put lines on top of that, and if you're lucky, they line up. Uh, then they tried, going back to the original method, they tried a different kind of printing called flexographic, where everything was a horrible day glow color. Like flesh was like a very deep salmon color, and everything went deeper from there. Uh, Steve Olaf is responsible for getting us into computers. There was a horribly expensive system back in the late 80s, and he dove in and bought that system. Uh, within five years, Photoshop came out in the Macintosh shortly later on the PC. And by the early 90s, we were all doing Photoshop. And how long and how does it long take you to color, color to issue go down? It takes longer because we do more. <laughs> Back then... The, uh, the, the, <laughs> well, uh, no, it's the, the uh, technique. I mean, back in the old days on newsprint, if it doesn't hit the lines exactly, good enough. And you can go through any comic, you know, from the 40s, you know, through mid-80s, and you'll see they're not in perfect register. Uh, and you have less colors. Now we have nearly infinite color. And uh, they like details. I mean, you know the image books. I mean, everyone looks like they're rendered in Chrome. They put in, you know, highlights on top of highlights, you know, shadows on top of shadows. So they expect more. And uh, I usually have about a month to do a book, and it takes the better part of that. Okay. See, what's what's interesting here is that Tom has gone through color groove for a long time and gone through quite a few different methods of coloring the book. In yeah, that but he's also don't forget that he's also been coloring uh, uh, the, all the covers and a lot of things for Stan for a long, long time. Oh, you know, he colors lots of things. I, the point we want to make here is that when Grook comes out as timely as it has in most cases, like I said, 120 issues in 120 months, we were with epic. Um, people say, oh, gee, Sergio's so fast and Mark's kind of fast. Well, they forget that the key points here are that Stan has been able to letter the book sometimes overnight, <laughs> sometimes on his anniversary, sometimes mm -hmm. on holidays. Uh, and Tom has been able to work miracles sometimes getting the book to press on time. It, the, the in, in not just this comic book, but in most comic books that are produced, the unsung heroes are the guy who does the lettering or the gal who does the lettering or the colorist. Uh, it, it, they, they manage to work miracles that sometimes are not obvious to the fans out there who just think that it's the guys who get the bigger names in the credit mm -hmm. box um, who, who are responsible. Um, Sergio, people want to know when Gru's coming out again. Now, you talked about how you started to try to come up with a funny Tarzan. We have now done a funny Tarzan meeting <laughs> Gru. Correct. With the help of a great uh, artist, Thomas Yates, who does the Sunday page for Prince Valiant. He's been doing it for a while. It's great, great work. And uh, we have always been reluctant to do crossovers. I always thought that that's an imposition on the authors because every character belongs to a certain universe, let's call it that way, and the author has been very careful to make sure that the character belongs there and everything around it belongs to that character. In the moment they do a crossover, it infringes on the, on the author they are alive, but it but also is a problem for the reader because they are fan of one and now they have to be fan of the other guy and sometimes they don't go together. But for a publisher it's a very very good business because like this they get two audiences together. So for a long time we Mark and I and uh, have said no to crossovers. They came with a logical one who was Guru Conan. And after, believe it or not, over a year of thinking about it and trying to figure out, we cannot do a crossover because Conan cannot beat Guru and Guru cannot beat Conan. 
because I'll be breaking the, the logical rules. But it took me quite a while, thought about it, the conversation with Mark. Mark totally went with it. And it was when I saw a movie called uh, Rashomon, a Japanese movie uh, by uh, Akira Kurosawa. And the, the, in that movie, the character is a bandit who takes some things and they get caught. And in front of the job, the victims, the witness and the bad guy, each one tell the story its own way. And says, that's ideal. That's, that's the plot. And we start working on it. And we arrived to it and uh, we develop it. It's Thomas Yates did the inking for his he character. The, he he drew the, actually drew the pay. He drew the, the Conan material and you drew the Gru material. Yes, I, 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 I lay it out first. So where the battles and everything was going to be. And I just put a very, very quick sketch, very badly drawn to where the Conan was going to be. Came out, four issues, they made a book. And it sold out. It was pretty well received. So, of course, we want another crossover. And the other character that the publisher uh, had the rights to publish was Tarzan. That was a little more difficult because the two characters kind of they don't belong to each. And to bridge the, the, the gap between the two characters, Mark and I, the concept about us. We are going to be part of the comic book. Like this is the in between the two universes. This is the third universe who Tarzan people cannot say, well, this cannot happen because it's in the mentality of these two bobos. And same thing with Gru. So it worked good with Conan. We did it with Tarzan. We were there. And it worked. That it was going to be published and the pandemic came in. So we have complete four issues. Tom Luth had the, the time of his life now to color it without any rush, to color <laughs> the Tarzan thing. And it's there, four issues, ready to go out. Total finish. We continue working on the on Groove with approval of the publisher, of course. And we had drawn a comic called The Play of the Gods. Oh, Gods uh, Against Gru. No, the before one. There, there's there's oh, two yeah. issues. Um, uh, the, um, they, they were... There was The Fray of the Gods and The Play of the Gods, I think. Yes. Was, it, yeah. yeah. Each yeah. four issues. This was the last one who was put on a book. And so we did a third one who was called the gods against Gru. So we draw it, we wrote it, we letter it, and it's there ready to be published after they publish Tarzan. So right now, Dark Horse, our publisher, has eight issues ready to go out. Meanwhile, Mark and I are working on the next four issues. That's right, and yes, we're, 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 we're way ahead. The, uh, the first issue of uh, the uh, Gru Tarzan crossover series will be coming out in July, uh, on or about the dates when the San Diego convention would have happened. Uh, and then it'll be proceed a month after that. And then when that's after that's out, uh, they'll be releasing Gods Against Gru, by which time we'll have the next one finished and the mm -hmm. next one after that finished and so on. So we're way ahead right now. Uh, the marketplace is coming back, as, as you may know, with the pandemic, a lot of comic book shops slowed down, a lot of the traffic of their customers slowed down. Uh, there are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of ramifications of, of the pandemic and ways it's affected practically every business in the world somehow. And, it, and comic book publishing uh, slowed to a crawl during that period. And now it's starting to creep back. And uh, we're just the creeps to have a book for it. Uh, so, one, sorry, one thing yeah. that has sold a lot are graphic novels for children, because a lot of the parents are now home with all the kids, and they have bought everything that is published for children, so they can read it to their kids. 
So that's uh, it's a very good omen for the future about about the graphic novel. It's, uh, I think it's uh, as a good uh, good future. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, I should mention as we told the history of um, Gru's publishing. You know, I, we left off with Gru at Epic. We did 120 issues there and two graphic novels, and then we were at, with Image Comics for 12 issues, and then Dark Horse took us in, and they've still got us. We're still doing mm -hmm. comics for Dark Horse. Uh, I have dug out while you were while we were getting online here. I dug out this photo just for the sake of this. Sergio, remember this picture? <laughs> you do. That was, oh my God, that's on my early studio. That's your studio that you had on Crescent Heights, not far from me, uh, for a while. Uh, we are those are pages from Pacific Comics we're holding. Um, this is probably shortly after Tom signed on. I don't know which issue number that is. He's Sergio's got there, but um, Tom was was fair, relatively new to the team at that point, and that's the studio Sergio had uh, at the time. So, uh, oh, and yeah. uh, wh whatever happened to those guys? They, they, now they look like this. <laughs> so, um, and um, let, let's talk for a minute about um, other other activities we do, Stan. Tell mm -hmm. us what's up with your rabbit. Well, I'm still working on the Usagi uh, Yojimbo series for IDW. And uh, besides news stories, IDW is also coloring and printing the uh, older stories. Uh, they were used to be black and white before, but now they're being uh, printed in color as well. Wow. It's the uh, that's, uh, Julie, uh, my wife Julie, is a wonderful cartoonist in her own right. And we've just finished a graphic novel uh, about Chibi Usagi. <laughs> That's and, sensational. Uh, yeah, it's great. Uh, like Sergio said, uh, the children's market, graphic novel, children's graphic market is the fastest growing segment in the comic book industry. And so we're doing a Chibi Usagi story graphic novel that's uh, aimed more towards the, say, about six to 12 year old, whereas Usagi's usually from, well, all readers, but a little older. And let's see, now we've got the Usagi Jimbo animated series that's coming out from Netflix. And I've been approving designs, um, scripts, um, animatics, and it's looking to be really good. I'm really happy with that. Wow. Now, I, this is my first time actually working in animation. And Mark, I'm just surprised at the writing process. I mean, you've got the, the premise, the uh, first draft, second draft, third draft, fourth draft, working script. I never knew you guys or writers like you had to go through so many uh, variations of the same story. It's very some, of, some of us don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's true. Uh, I don't. I haven't worked that way in a long time. Mm. Uh, sometimes, you know, you know the the secret of uh, of, of any project, a, comic, a collaborative project, and comic books are an example of that. Is you have to make sure everyone's working on the same show, yeah. or working on the same comic book. We have to be in sync on it, and you generally have to have one person that knows exactly what's right and wrong for the project. Uh, I've worked for many, many years on Garfield stuff, and Jim Davis, who you know created Garfield, was the final word on no Garfield wouldn't do that. Garfield wouldn't say that. With Gru, Sergio was the final word. It's nice to have a one person that has that kind of power and that kind of command of the entire overview, the overview of the entire series. And when you have that, you don't need to go through 12 drafts with 18 mm -hmm. different people. As as you narrow down, you're going to find if you keep working on this for a while, eventually you'll be down to, you know, two drafts. Right. Well, I have to uh, create approval over everything. And yeah. one thing I was surprised at is that the few times I had worked in animation, uh, I remember storyboards. And they don't have storyboards anymore. It's animatics, which, which is better. It's like uh, an animated storyboard. So it's Makes yeah. it a lot easier. Well, there's there's now more diverse ways of doing cartoons than there have ever been before. Not mm -hmm. only in terms of different types of animation processes, thanks to computers, but also there's so many different people doing animation. Mm 
For a long time, you know, Disney would do their animation. Everyone would do as much of Di would make their process as much like Disney's as they could afford. And then all of a sudden, everybody was trying to imitate Hanna Barbera's process. Mm -hmm. And now there's no one central place. So, yeah. so they've they have undoubtedly invented a, a procedure for your show, which works for that show. And as the people who work on it, the many people hands that are involved, come know the characters better because they can't know it. Mm -hmm. They can't know it as well as you do at this stage. As they learn more about it, the process will grow and narrow down, and and you'll. Uh, it will become more of a controlled team effort. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and so, also the, the fans had a lot to say about it because if you if you maintain, you find. And one thing that Usagi has, because Stan from the beginning had a direct contact with a readership. In every comic, he answered the places, and he developed an enormous fan group uh, following that really love the character and belongs to them. And Stan being in charge has maintained Usagi the way that has been from the beginning. And the fans love that. Yeah. And I'm very sure that when Stan goes with the fans, they're going to follow him. And that will be such a strong support for what he's doing. That will be, an, I can tell you right now, it's going to be a one of the best successful stories ever with a, with a character on the animation. And I the fans have to do a lot of things. Yeah, it's like well, great fans. It's a group. There's a lot of great group fans, a group. But for the animation, I'm working with Gamont, and Gamont's the world's oldest film company, and they're great to work with. I worked with Gamont once. Yes, they are, yes. Mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, one of the interesting things, we were talking earlier about creator-owned comics. Um, and it, 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 the good and bad of that comes into these, uh, as I've enumerated here, Gru has gone through many, many publishers. If the first publisher owned Gru, who would control Gru today? If Pacific, if if Pacific Comics had had owned Gru, then when Pacific Comics was, you know, assets were li were liquidated in a bankruptcy sale, who would have wound up owning Gru? Probably mm -hmm. would not have been Sergio, and they might have turned it, the comic into something else or had somebody else do it. Uh, by virtue of the fact that Sergio owned Gru, Gru gets to retain the same creative team and he gets control of it no matter where it goes. This is not the case with a lot of characters over there. We can all name a, a wonderful comic character that we didn't like when somebody else had control of it. Um, you know, even in this day, to this day, to be a fan of Batman, and if you're a if you're a lover of Batman, you prefer some Batmans to others. Mm -hmm. You like Batman by this writer and this artist. You don't like Batman by this writer and that artist uh, because there's so many different versions of Batman, so many different versions of the X-Men, and so many different versions of Superman. With yeah. something like Usagi Ojimbo or Gru, you need to kind of like all of them or none of them <laughs> because yeah. they're all of a piece, and there yeah. are a lot of different interpretations of Gru yeah, uh, well, by the, different the people. The thing is that many of the big companies, when they own the character, one of the reasons they want to own it is not for the economics themselves. It's because if the character is owned by the author, everything they do, they have to consult with us. Mm -hmm. If they do a character, we're going to do a T-shirt, they have to come to us to see if that's what we like the character. And if, if, if they own it, they do what, all the garbage or badly or whatever they care. It's just about the money. It's not about the quality of the product. Yeah. But with us, it has to be about the quality of the product because we say no. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. You know? So it's very yeah. important. Yeah. And, and the other thing, of course, is it's not even just, you know, the publisher, the publisher changes. Every time we turn around, there's somebody new owning, running DC, and somebody mm -hmm. new running Marvel. So even if you're happy with the way Marvel handles a character today, Six months from now, somebody else may be calling the shots over there, and he may want somebody else writing the comic or drawing the comic. It's it's uh, there's a consistency here that that I think is it's it's very nice, and we we enjoy working in that environment. We enjoy the fact that there isn't somebody else doing another version of Gru that comes out at the same time. Oh yeah, uh, there's just one there's just one Gru for good, bad, or indifferent. Um, so you know, uh, and that's uh, we we should emphasize here that Stan. You know, built his little empire there, all in his own efforts. I mean, 
Tom was coloring a lot of stuff in there, but you pick up an issue of Usagi and it's, you know, 92% Stan Sakai or whatever the number is, the applicable number. Uh, it, he, it, it's, he writes it, he draws it, he controls it. He literally his vision. Yeah, he oh he letters it. He didn't yeah, he didn't farm he didn't farm that out yet. Um, uh, so um it, it's and, and I think that um comic books that are done with a unified vision behind them are my favorite comics. Mm-hmm. When I think even if even you know, when I look at a, a period of I like Batman. I like those Batmans because the person who was in charge was really in charge and they had an overreaching view of it. So uh, this is one of the things we're proud of. There's, there's downsides to being an independent. Um, the, the great uh, comedy writer, Larry Gelbart, uh, used to say, an independent movie producer is a movie producer who's dependent on everyone. Uh, and we are dependent you know, to some extent on Dark Horse and the distributors and the, and the retailers and the wholesalers and all those things. But we are doing something that, um, you know, when it, when, it, when it gets on the stands, um, if it stinks, it's our fault. And if it's wonderful, it's our fault. So uh, <laughs> it's much easier that way. Uh, Sergio, uh, would you like to say a little bit about MAD? Yes. I, All right. I have over half a century working with them. So <laughs> it's, um, I started in 62. I'm not going to go so far. And uh, I've been with them in every issue but one by uh, my fault. I was in Europe and uh, I miscalculated the post office and it didn't arrive in time. So I missed one issue. But so far I've been in every issue. And the last one that we did, it was dedicated to me. And that was the last one with, with original material. Now, that, yeah, Mad, Mad still has new covers. Yes. And they do a couple of new pages inside some of them. Yes. But essentially, it's a reprint magazine now. Yes. Um, of, and, and then... Uh, you know, yeah, that, how, the, how the mighty have fallen. Well, uh, look, people get age, magazines get age. They arrive to a certain point and they die. They cannot last forever because the audience changes. It's not the magazine that changes, it's the audience. That well, it's, it's, the it's, audience. It's, also, it's also the format that changes. Magazines in general are not what they used to be. There's no Playboy magazine either. And that's not because people have no interest in naked women anymore. It's because it's a magazine. No, that's Magazines... strange because naked women are not where they used to be. Now they have. Hold on. Certain... Let me see if I've got. Let me see if I've got one here. Since for no, example. no. Anyway, nowadays uh... the audience again has changed. The women have a, have gotten the respect that they deserve in society, not only by the little old ladies who got the vote. Eventually, they got the respect of the office. And right now, that aspect has changed. Before, all that magazine cartooning was a boss running after a secretary. That was the, the okay. humor. And we all laughed at that when we were young. Ah, you cannot do that. The audience has changed. Same thing with the comics. The superheroes have changed because in the moment... You disappeared the little strings that hot Superman. That was the moment with the technology that Superman flew and you were amazed. Then they found out with computers that you didn't have to destroy a building. You destroy the whole city. And then you destroy all the cars. And then you destroy all the universes. So a lot of kids don't want to go back to see a static volcano erupting when you can have a real erupting and the whole house tremble because the special effects are so good now. So the audience have made the object change. So comics have just yes. changed, not because of the quality of the author, but because of the kids demand something else. To the point that I don't understand anymore the movies. 
because they are made for more younger audience than I am. I want logic. I want a good editing. I want to see what happened after that. Now they don't show it anymore. I used to enjoy the, the big fights or romance or exploration and climbing. Now I cannot count to seven in any modern movie of action without having a cut. Hmm. Every second they have a cut. You cannot count seven. You go one, two, one, 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 two, one, two, three, one, one, one. That's the cut in every movie. I cannot watch it. <clears throat> if my brain goes <laughs> all over the place. So that's a big change. And uh, we have to accept the fact that very soon, all the, the, the comics right now, they are read in this size. You think the people who spend their life looking at everything in here are going to care for the backgrounds or for the details on the buildings or the research that we do to find out for a, a whole uh, space where the character works around, a market, with all the little details that we put on and find out where the character walks around. Or in a Japanese, uh, in a Japanese battle that Stan does. No, this way. Yeah, that's right. Stands up there. <laughs> he puts a lot of characters and really a good image. They cannot see it in here. They won't care about it. They want to go from the beginning to the end. So you can give them a million uh, cuts. So is the audience. So no, I don't know what's going to happen. But so, so you're telling, so we're telling Tom that in the future you're not going to put a lot of backgrounds or crowd scenes into the. Well, I have to avoid them from now on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll believe that. When it, I'll believe that when it happens. Okay, but another thing which has inhibited Mad is the fact that right now, when something happens in politics, in current events. Within an hour, there's tons of jokes on Twitter about it and on websites. And that night, Stephen Colbert has material on it. Seth Meyers has material on it. Jimmy Kimmel has material on it. And, and two days later, that's all over. And then eight weeks later, MAD comes out. Hmm. MAD cannot keep, could not keep up with the current speed with which t current events get, get dispensed with in this world. That's on the political side of it, but for instance, about the movies, that they, they can make right now phone, show the reprints of all the movies that a lot of people are being watching on television. So it's not a new movie, but they're going to enjoy a satire of movies that they never saw mm. because they were very young or they were uh, they missed it. But now they're going to see a lot of Hitchcock, a lot of the classics being satirized and mad. And that's going to bring a lot of uh, uh, audiences, even if they are reprints. The only people who are going to suffer are the authors because they're not going to make a living out of it. But the, the, the magazine could be uh, a very good memorabilia of what it was, you know, and we'll manage it with younger audience, the younger authors, maybe. It can, it can have a revival very, very soon. And uh, so to me, Mad hasn't disappeared. It's still there, and it's going to be there. And fortunately, as you know, I, I did a, a, a new set of marginals, which I'm still working for Mad. Okay. So, which is pretty All right. good. So, and, I, and I have a feeling Mad is going to make a big comeback in, a, in the next year or two. I think they're going it, to... It's too valuable a name for them to let it languish. It's too valuable a brand. And they're going to find some way to resurrect what's wonderful about mad because um first of all these days nothing ever goes away that long i mean it, look at look at some of the obscure comic book characters who are now up for movies yeah, you know, yeah. Gr groot i didn't even remember groot so yeah. um go ahead it, while you talk can i show tom something for him to faint oh okay what <laughs> did you draw what did you draw now that he has to color okay well, go ahead some of the issues of, of the gods against Gru, they, 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 he would like this. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> wait, wait a second. Excuse me. I'm allergic oh. to crowd scenes. Uh, 
Uh, Tom, this is what you're going to be coloring for the rest of your life. This, these, <laughs> these, these spreads here. Uh, okay. Some of the reasons. Sergio is enjoying this too much. He's enjoying this. 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 We're going to show uh, Tom the next stuff he has to color. Too much. But the advantage now is any time to do it. You know that the cover is is going to be a very simple cover. You know, it's a, yeah. it's a, it's the gods and, and groove. No? That, that's no problem. But then we have page I'm gonna, two. Hold on, I'm going to put Sergio on full screen here for a this second. This is like page, page number four. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. The stanza guy saw that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like those big crowd scenes because there's very little lettering in them. And uh, then we have, uh, they, they, they are normal pages. They all have, did, did, did you see this, this drawing stand that it was on the back of the page? Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. There's a marionette. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Usagi's not liking it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> with his hand up, you know, with my hand up. You know. <laughs> but they, they are very, very normal pages, you know. But this one that I wanted to see it, for him to see. Oh, this is one of the ones that he liked. Oh, the ship. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. I think this. I think that's going to be another rib, Tom. I think it's going to cost you another rib. So this will come out uh, Christmas oh, next year. In, in a couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's not a page I wanted to show you. Yeah, that that's an easy one. Yeah, that's an easy one. But in issue number three. And the cover is a, is a is a different cover, you know. It's a basic one, mm -hmm. you know, with a, the title goes in here, and then we have all the, the gods with a group, and then of course the priests priests are going to be there, and we have pages like this for the, the fans will enjoy this too. Before, you know that. We should point out here that Gru is one of the very few comic books done today where the letterer letters right on the page. Uh, this is how it used to be all the time, and now mm -hmm. lettering is done by computer for the most part, and it goes on. It's added in a, in a layer in Photoshop separately, and, and it does not appear on the actual artwork in most cases. Or if it is, it's pasted on later. But actually, uh, Stand letters on the same exact pieces of paper Sergio draws on. Yeah, this is a, a, a good page for, for, for Tom to look at. Oh, yeah. he, ha he has all the gods. And <laughs> then he... <laughs> well, I'm just going to put a pale blue wash across the entire page. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, but I I saw that there was an issue. Number two. I'll take them up later. <laughs> this, this is a phone cover. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Here, here. The, 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 these pages are fun, you know, like. Oh, boy. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> but what about this one? <laughs> oh, my Lord. <laughs> okay, I quit. That's a nice one. <laughs> You're giving away the whole story, Sergio. 
Well. Hey, I can't even understand it from this. <laughs> that is nice. All right. That that is a is a is the gods fighting, you know. He fighting the gods from different regions from all kinds and then of course the storm in front on the bottom boy so it's a it's a, it's a double spread page <laughs> you can put them in any order it doesn't matter no it doesn't matter but all the pages are pretty empty <laughs> yeah <laughs> Oh my God, that's pandemic. I, I sit here, and I have the time. So, so then you just put a lot of the tales, you know. That's crazy. It is crazy, but it's fun. Oh, this is a fun one too. <laughs> Sergio, there's some white space on that page. What happened? Where, where? The, the, let me fill it up. <laughs> where, where, where? <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And Ruferto is there and everything is, uh, it's a lot of fun. But all the issues are done. And mm -hmm. I'm waiting for the publisher to send them to you, Tom. So you have a couple of years to do it. Tom is, Tom, Tom, Tom is training the dogs to flat in, put in the flat colors. Yes. <laughs> well. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap this up, gentlemen? Anybody? Anything else you want to talk about, Sergio? we got a few more minutes if you'd like. I, I miss the guys at the convention. I miss seeing the people who like what I do. That's basically what I miss the most. Because well, all know, the students I, I meet in the, with a Zoom and we talk. But meeting the guys who go there, the, the older guys who come and says, I learned with Gru and so is my son. And this is my grandson who loves the character, loves Ruferto. These little details, it makes the, the raison d'etre, the, the, the way we live for, is meeting all the people who sit there. And some people just want an autograph or whatever. But the people who like the group are in line for a while. They come back and, and they tell you, yes, we are your people. You know, it's just amazing. I love it. I miss the convention enormously. We all, we all miss the conventions for one reason or another. Some for financial, some for inspiration, some for that, that release of just getting out of the house and, and, and realizing the reach that your your work has, uh, you know, it's just uh, it, it's it's it, it, it's difficult to say that's a terrible thing when you have a pandemic that's killing people and destroying whole industries. It seems trivial that we don't get to meet people who read our comics, but it it does matter to us on some level. It is it is worth noting that we miss it. And that we miss the people, and and I think how wonderful it's going to be when we finally can get a convention again. Uh, the convention center where Comic Con is usually held in San Diego is currently a homeless shelter, and there's hundreds and hundreds of homeless people who are there. They've got cots, they've got uh, uh, showers that have been installed, and there's there's big projection TVs that run movies for them, and they food. get fed, they get food, they get, there's, there's, they've served like a million meals since the pandemic started out of that building. And I hope it's not the people who were making the meals when we <laughs> ate there, who we visited. And I feel like I want to go down there and do a, do panels with the homeless people or something like that, because I miss that, that environment. I miss San Diego. Uh, I have been to every San Diego convention every multi-day San Diego convention there has been. I'm one of like four or five people who've done that. And it became part of my life to go down there every year and to see all these people. And And it's nice that we can keep in contact by us, things like this and Zoom. And, you know, we, we frequently Zoom, not for YouTube or any other place, for just for ourselves so we can see each other's faces. Sergio and I have been known to 
go online at uh, you know two in the morning and talk to each other like this and discuss <laughs> stuff and, and tell us tell each other dirty stories and stuff. Uh, but uh, it, it's it's part of the Comic Con experience and part of doing comics is that interaction with the people. Mm-hmm. And it's been missing for some time for us. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when they said, said, hey, Mark, can you do some panels for WonderCon we can put online? I said, yes. I just wanted the excuse to get as close as I can to that experience again. So that's why I've been doing these panels. Yeah. Um, Stan, it's nice to see you again, even though I see yes. you on Sunday. You, uh, Friday's usually for our little lunch lunch Zooming. I, I do I do a lunch zooming with the Magic Castle people, and then I do the lunch zooming with you guys, the cartoonists, people like that. I just it's like table hopping from party to party. And yeah. and Tom, it's good to see you again. We haven't seen You're enough true. of you lately. And and uh, good luck with the rib. And Sergio, I'll talk to you tonight probably later. Yes. So uh, anyway, uh, we're going to wrap this up here, folks. Thank you for joining us uh, and watching this show. There's a lot of other ones online from the convention. Uh-huh. On WonderCon at home. Tell them we'll see them next year. We will see you whenever there's another convention. We will be there. Yeah. And we hope to see you in person, even if you've got a mask on. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye, Sam. Bye, Tom. Bye, Mark. Bye, guys.